Hello and welcome to the webinar. Um, this is Keith Johnson. I am co-chair of um, Reinhardt Institutional Investor Services. And uh, we would like to thank our co-sponsors for helping uh, pull together this webinar today, in addition to Reinhardt Institutional Investor Services. The uh, webinar co-sponsors are Focusing Capital on the Long Term, Sussman Godfrey, CECP um, CEO Investor Forum, and for those of you that don't know, CECP stands for Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose. Uh, global Investor Collaboration Services, which is the Secretariat for a uh, Global Investor Network, and Preventable Surprises. Uh, today's uh, webinar will be recorded and uh, will be made available on the Reinhardt website. We will also circulate slides to registrants afterwards with a uh, link to the recording. Um, the participants are uh, muted during the presentations, but feel free to type in questions in the uh, chat box. And uh, at the end of the uh, presentations, we'll have hopefully time for some Q&A. And if you would like to be unmuted to ask a question verbally, uh, there is a, uh, a hand at the, uh, on the uh, right side of your screen. I think you can uh, press that when we uh, get to the Q&A if you'd like to ask something uh, live. So let's get started. Uh, the, Webinar focus today, uh, if we go to the first slide, is uh, going to be essentially on three topics. Um, first of all, we're going to discuss research showing that uh, companies manage to long-term plans outperform and do so with lower risk. Secondly, we'll be exploring Delaware court cases that have begun to imply that there is a long-term strategic planning fiduciary duty for boards of directors. And third, the uh, coronavirus is expected to present investor options to improve company long-term performance and risk management into the new normal post-COVID-19 and uh, there are some opportunities that we're going to highlight by combining the um, research on long-term corporate strategic planning and corporate law developments to uh, improve performance for investors. The uh, team that is presenting on these topics is shown on the next page. We're lucky to have some uh, very experienced um, and expert presenters. Ariel Babcock is uh, Managing Director and Head of Research at FCLT Global, and she's formerly a uh, Portfolio Manager. Ken McNeil is a litigation partner at Sussman Godfrey, and uh, also a former sociology professor at the University of Wisconsin. And Brian Tomlinson is Director of Research at the CEO Investor Forum, and previously was managing director of the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism. More detailed bios are available at the link on the bottom of the slide. But Ariel, let's uh, get started. Can you uh, give us an overview of uh, recent research on long-term strategic planning and on the role of FCLT? Happy to do that, and thanks for including us on the conversation today, Keith. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees for joining as well. So um, we're looking at a unprecedented time, but uh, FCLT Global, which stands for Focusing Capital on the Long Term, is an organization that is, um, I think, particularly well suited to help manage through crises like these. We are a nonprofit organization that um, develops evidence-based tools and solutions to help encourage a longer term approach to investment decision making across the investment value chain. Um, we're supported by leading global asset owners, asset managers, and 
large multinational corporations. Um, the thing we're really focused on is the, the evidence around effective long-term capital allocation. We find that um, allocating capital towards longer term investment horizons is fundamental for innovating and creating value um, and is essential to delivering better outcomes across the investment value chain for savers and in support of economic growth more broadly. But we find pervasive short termism in the marketplace um, that can be especially costly to both companies and the broader societies in which they operate. And even the corporate board is susceptible to that pervasive short-term perspective. Um, in particular, we find boards of directors can indeed wield the ability to influence corporate purpose, culture, and direction of an organization and can set an appropriate long-term tone um, for both management and shareholders. And providing that steadying tone for an organization is especially essential um, in times that uh, are compar comparable to what we're seeing today with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so moving ahead, who is FCLT Global? As I mentioned, we're a nonprofit um, research-based organization that is uh, essentially takes an evidence-based approach to developing our solutions. Um, if we take a look at who our member organizations are, um, I'll take a step back and just give you a little bit of a, a, a summary. So um, our organization was first conceived of in 2013. It began with a series of conversations between um, the then Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, who's now known as CPP Investments, and McKinsey and & Company. And that series of conversations attracted the interest of several like-minded individuals, including BlackRock, Tata Sons from India and Dow Chemical. Um, ultimately, over the course of the next several years, these organizations convened to discuss the challenges they were seeing in the capital markets and the ways that their organizations were being particularly pressured by short-term behaviors that they found were driving poorer outcomes um, and uh, were misaligning their behaviors in terms of the original purpose and mission of those organizations. So ultimately, the decision was taken to launch FCLT Global as a standalone not-for-profit organization in 2016. And our mission is really to drive capital towards those longer-term investment horizons um, in support of the broader economy and the savers that participate in that economy. Um, how do we do that? If you flip to the next page, you'll see that we believe very strongly that effective capital markets allocate long-term savings and can fuel that innovation and growth. Um, if you think about the players across the investment value chain, they have inherently long-term goals in mind. Savers have long-term goals. They're saving for retirement or for providing for the next generation. Um, they typically give significant assets to the asset owners. So these are pension funds, large endowments, sovereign wealth funds. They are tasked with investing to match the long-term goals of their beneficiaries who are ultimately the savers. Um, many owners place assets externally with asset managers that have particular expertise. Those managers manage the assets with particular horizons and incentives and goals in mind. Um, and then the managers allocate that capital towards companies who often are making multi-year investments um, in growing their businesses. The companies um, support the communities and other stakeholders in which they operate. And we see this beneficial cycle of um, each individual player across the investment value chain beginning with very long-term goals and intentions in mind. Um, but what we often see is that interactions between these players cause frictions that generate shorter term behaviors um, and that those behaviors tend to drive the bus, especially in a crisis environment. Um, why do we care about that? If you turn to the next slide, you'll see that there's strong evidence. Um, so I'm on slide eight now, thank you. There's strong evidence that long-term companies have delivered significantly stronger financial results and do in fact create more jobs. Um, if you look at some of our early work, we 
identified companies that were managed in a long-term way on a variety of financial metrics and compared them to their shorter-term peers over a period of time that spanned the last financial crisis. And while we found that the long-term companies were punished by the market in the midst of crisis, their stocks did more poorly because they stuck to their long-term strategies, invested um, you know, maintained their investments in R&D and maintained their headcount. And um, in the face of that, their peers were taking action to shore up margins, show up revenue, shore up profits. But ultimately, the companies we saw sticking with their long-term strategy came out ahead. So their stocks rebounded faster post-crisis than um, their peer stocks did. And they ultimately delivered 47% more revenue, 36% superior earnings growth, 81% higher economic profit. You know, on a range of metrics that we've displayed here on this slide, they had um, better outcomes across the board. And the key takeaway here is really that had the short-term peers been able to achieve similar results, we would have seen even more significant economic growth and job creation on the backside of the financial crisis. So there's there's very meaningful material reasons to focus on, um, on taking that longer term approach to strategic planning and investment. Um, if you flip ahead, you'll see this long-term behavior really does deliver that superior performance. So long-term companies, as I mentioned before, out earn their peers, um, companies that reinvest back into their organizations via fixed investment and investments in R&D, for example, deliver superior return on invested capital. Um, there's, a, there's also significant evidence that in the years following engagement with an investee company, investors themselves average superior excess return. So there's benefits on both sides of the coin for taking this longer term approach. Um, despite that evidence, as we'll see on the next slide, short-term pressures are really hard to avoid. Um, we've seen in survey after survey, executives and directors citing pressure to deliver performance within their first two years of assuming the role and admitting that in terms of planning horizons, um, they use a less than three-year horizon. So um, many directors say that short-term pressures have compromised management's focus, um, that taking a longer-term approach would add value, but they find themselves unable to do it, and that they consistently sacrifice um, value-added projects to hit shorter-term targets. Um, you'll see the result of some of this behavior on the next slide. Um, we find a whole range of investment gaps, uh, capex levels that are hovering near 20-year lows, R&D investment um, levels relative to GDP that are uh, similarly quite low. Um, unfortunately, World Bank data is a little bit dated, but that's the most recent number. We have available and then you know as i said before in survey after survey we find the ceos prefer projects with shorter time horizons and often say that it's the investment community that won't give them credit for longer term projects um, we also we we see some similar things happening when we look at the the drivers of longer or shorter term behavior um, We've identified four in particular that are essential for inspiring longer term outcomes, but are also quite often the source, the source, excuse me, of that short term behavior we're trying to alleviate. So those tend to be governance structures. You can have governance that is um, structured to encourage a longer term perspective, but also governance mechanisms in place that drive shorter term behaviors. Um, similarly, incentive structures can uh, inspire or prevent a longer term approach versus a shorter term approach. Uh, engagement across the investment value chain is often a place where um, 
players tend to influence each other. And if you have a shorter term actor influencing the behaviors of other members of the chain, that short term behavior spills over into those other parts of the capital markets. So taking a long term tone and approach in your engagement with the other members of um, the investment value chain can add or detract. And then finally, we see that um, strategy is obviously the place where uh, the, the rubber really hits the road. And we're going to talk a little bit more about strategy going forward here. But if you don't have a, a long-term goal in mind, um, you're really never going to never going to arrive. Um, so if we flip ahead, what is the board's role really? Um, boards have a very significant role to play here. And our research um, what has been focused on the subject of how a corporate board can really set that long-term tone at the top. Um, we've conducted a series of studies and interviews alongside Professor Bob Eccles from Oxford's Business School and Russell Reynolds Associates and found that long-term boards have several very distinct characteristics. The two I'll focus on here are that they spend significantly more time on strategy-related work and they have regular communications directly with their long-term shareholders. Um, the other two factors that often are hallmarks of long-term boards are uh, ownership mentality that is um, demonstrated by the structure of director compensation and um, diversity at the board level, not just in terms of um, demographics or gender, but in terms of skill set and um, experience. So those those final two aren't things that you can uh, move the needle on quite so quickly. So today we'll focus on the first two. Um, on the next slide, you'll see uh, we know that strategy is a key area where boards can add value. Um, there are a number of studies, most notably a McKinsey study that found high impact boards spend 20 extra days per year on board related work and the bulk of that work was spent on strategy alone when compared to average or lower performing boards. Um, similarly, evidence from the Nordic companies uh, demonstrates consistent outperformance over long horizons when the board is intimately involved in the setting the strategic direction of the company. Um, and they take a, a very much uh, consulting and execution approach when it comes to management. But we also know from our research that many boards struggle to prioritize their strategic work. Board time is increasingly spent on compliance and risk-related tasks. Um, and board members often confess that while strategy tends to be on the agenda, it um, th there's never sufficient time remaining in the meeting to uh, give it their full attention. Um, despite having access to sufficient information, so 93% of directors admit that information is not the problem here. Uh, they get the information they need from management. It really is a question of time and focus. And to a certain extent, some survey data suggests that skill set and composition of the board plays a role as well. Um, so strategy is one thing boards can really focus on, especially in the midst of a crisis, but preferably they've done that long-term strategic planning work in advance. Um, the, the second thing that I want to focus on is highlighted on the next slide, and that is that long-term boards regularly communicate directly with their long-term shareholders. Director shareholder engagement is becoming increasingly more common, and some companies are also making it much easier to engage with their board. But despite those encouraging trends, we see few directors still view regular dialogue with shareholders as necessary. Um, only 22% of directors thought regular engagement was appropriate. This is something that really has to change for um, for boards to begin taking that long-term focus and taking the longer-term perspective of their shareholders into account um, when setting the agenda for the company. So why, um, why do they need to talk to shareholders? Some of that evidence is detailed on the following slide. Most investors are already focused on the long-term. Um, 
according to McKinsey, 70% of shares in U.S. companies are owned by long-term investors or people with longer-term perspectives and approaches to their investment management decisions. There is survey after survey demonstrating that the investment community wants a long-term strategy and a long-term perspective from the company that they are invested in. And there have been several investor statements attesting to this effect, um, especially the UNPRI signatories statement on urging companies to focus their communications on issues and metrics relative to the long-term success of the business. Um, on the final page, you'll see that communication of long-term strategy is not really just for the investors. It also benefits companies by speaking to the time horizon that's most relevant to them. So effectively communicating a long-term strategy can lower a company's cost of capital, decrease share price volatility, attract a longer-term investor base. We find strong evidence suggesting that the presence of long-term shareholders is positively associated with long-term value creation. Um, it's a, it's this, you sort of get this beneficial feedback loop where the more long-term shareholders you have, uh, the more positive the association you see with long-term value creation, and then that attracts more long-term shareholders to your stock. Um, those long-term shareholders can serve in a, as an activist defense, and companies who have attracted them with that well-articulated long-term strategy have shareholders that are more likely to stand by them in the face of short-term attacks. So those long-term investors can be a fortress when it comes to disruptive action by potentially shorter-term players in the capital markets. Um, they also ensure more accurate valuation of the company. So we know from economic theory that 70 to 90 percent of the value of a company is related to cash flows three or more years out into the future. Um, if a company is not communicating on that horizon, it's very difficult for the market to properly value their stock. Um, so sharing their long-term strategy is essential to ensuring that value proposition is well communicated and the share price can accurately reflect that potential future value. Um, there's also a lot of internal benefits. So the International Integrated Reporting Council has found that managers have said business decision-making improves and have admitted to better uh, alignment between the board and management when a long-term plan has been shared publicly. Um, so just summing up there, there's some real strong evidence you'll see on the next slide um, that taking a longer-term approach to investment decision-making add adds value. Um, we know that there is pervasive short-termism in the market, and we know that boards have the ability to influence the direction of their organization and set that appropriate long-term tone that brings superior performance over time to their organizations. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over uh, to the next speaker to, to think a little bit more about the board's role. Thank you, Ariel. Right. Ken, can you give us uh, a, a view on the trends in corporate law that should be of interest to investors in preparing companies for the uh, new normal? Absolutely. Ariel has focused on a huge disconnect between the interests of long-term investors who have a long-term interest and corporations, 85% of which have no strategic planning beyond three to five years. Uh, the stars are really aligned here, I think, uh, for reasons I will tell you, for a shift in corporate thinking right now. Business models are out the window for all kinds of industries, from hospitals to airlines, and they're either going to more frantic short-termism, or this is a window and a time for a new normal in which they realize that the only way out of this mess is, is long-term strategic thinking. Corporations on a massive scale will be, quote, doing something, end quote, here in the next year or two, and we need, as investors and long-term investors, need to shape it. The question that we face is how, and as I might go to the next slide, crisis has always been the time when new thinking occur and new types of corporate strategic approaches are created. I take the bellwether industry in the United States, the auto industry. Right after World War I, uh, huge cars were being produced by General Motors, huge numbers, 
and suddenly there were various recessions. And by the way, a little pandemic occurred back then. As a result, they almost went bankrupt. And a, a, very, a genius by the name of Alfred Sloan then became president of General Motors and began to develop financial controls to check carefully inventory. That is the beginning, the origin in the United States of short-term accounting in its final in its in its fine points. That model pervades accounting decentralized financial control models today was started right after World War I because they had to deal with the crisis. The problem, that was a very well-tailored model that worked for decades, but it left one thing out. It left long-term consumer satisfaction and product quality out. So in the night by 1980, the Japanese uh, 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 companies were able to invade the U.S. market and shift by 20% in two years market share, which is for an oligopoly uh, incredible. One in six jobs in the U.S. were affected by that. So the point I want to go to, I think that auto industry story tells us it, it is a setup for three simple points I want to make. Once every generation or two, I mean generation or two, there's a true opportunity to reshape corporate thinking, and it's always in a deep crisis. Second, that's going to take real new thinking on our part that understands two concepts about large-scale corporate behavior. The first is that corporations think. They think with their accounting systems, and if those are short-term, the thinking of corporate directors will inevitably be biased toward the short-term as well. Second, current Delaware law on the fiduciary duty of directors for no you know, insidious reason, but has a bias toward short-term thinking, one which can only be remedied, in my opinion, by slightly changing the rules of the game and extending the duty of loyalty, the duty of monitor to include in, in situations where long-term risks are clear and evident and on the, on, the, on the statements, they have to be, there has to be some consideration of short-term, long-term strategic assessment of risk. Uh, but even if a short-term decision is made. Now, using these two fundamental concepts, you as pension funds and long-term investors can begin to more quickly, I think, shift corporate behavior than all the publicity campaigns and attempts at government regulation out there. And, and to give you just a brief picture of my experience on that, we might go to the next slide. I, I want to, to focus on, on Albert Einstein's quote, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. I first had, a, at the beginning of my career, a front row seat as a professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison, focusing on legal regulation and corporate behavior. And I ran a, 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 a study for the Law and Social Science Division of the National Science Foundation to figure out how the short-term accounting systems almost tanked the auto industry in the late 70s and early 80s. And I and in and documenting thereby this shift in corporate thinking when they suddenly realized product quality was not more expensive, customer satisfaction was essential, and today that's the gospel in which uh, in an industry where that thinking was anathema in the 1970s. So I know it can change and I saw it happen there and we documented it with great a number of studies and, and surveys. Then I found a, another front row seat to research large-scale corporate behavior for three decades as a partner in Sussman Godfrey. We handled huge litigation around the world in almost every country. And, and in that role, I, I've worked with corporations that do long-term strategic think, planning, and I've seen how their profits stay high over the long term. And I've also seen one train wreck after another caused by corporations that do short-term thinking. So let's talk about how we get new thinking. And so if we go to the next slide, I think one point I want to make is a host of factors are coming together to shake up business as usual, allowing you to shape the new normal for corporations to be a focus on long-term strategic thinking. Business is becoming heavily involved. Legal tools are developing, I think, which we'll talk about here. Research on long-term profitability, such as those Ariel has done, and I think more and more investor calls for sustainable wealth. And as the next slide then shows, the first piece of that puzzle coming together is the August statement by 181 business roundtable CEOs involving commitment to long-term value for shareholders. That's starting from Jamie Diamond on down. Jamie was one of the chief culprits 
in the in and 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 when he, in his in his investment bank work uh, when he missed and his his uh, bank missed the huge uh, uh, rising number of defaults in, in mortgage credits and even though they had indexes inside their company that they didn't get uh, to the focus to the top of that corporation next. The failure of this long-term strategic planning and risk assessment really is the elephant in the room that's, that's overshadowing everything here that's going on in a world of diminishing resources, need to take care of these workers, who many of whom are out of the jobs on the streets as we look out our windows. Let's go to the next slide. Even with the best of intentions, a corporation cannot address internal issues which adversely affect broader society without long-term risk assessment and strategic planning. That is, I compare it, and Keith and I compare it in this article we've written, the Elephant in the Room article on, on, on how we can help change Delaware law as using a three-mile three radar on a super tiger. You can't turn one of those around without first having a radar that sees further than your turnaround right. Let's go. Let's go to the next slide. Now the radar for corporations or accounting systems, what they measure or don't measure has everything to do with the choices directors make in a bureaucracy. That's where my career began. The, 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 how accounting systems can either create efficiency, or they can create massive inefficiencies depending on what they focus on. And what we have here right now is a tendency to have short-term accounting systems are, are proliferated from the days of the auto industry in the 1920s. Long-term accounting, until it's there, a director is acting with a blind eye. He's only he, in, in assessing long term versus short term. He's seeing all the good on profit short term. He's not seeing the long term profit data or the long term risk. Next slide. Only 15% of American corporations are doing any long term strategic planning. That's incredible. The McKinsey study 85% have no uh, uh, a, a strategic plan. 75% of S&P 1500 companies have no long-term measures of capital efficiency. Th third, no measure of future value of the company, 85%. No long-term incentive plans, 85%. You cannot incentivize and change the th way of thinking when all the, while the accounting indicators are working against you. Next. In fact, if you look at the fact that most companies on the, on the stock market are valued much of most of their value is future value, and there's a lot of research on this, that if it's future value going out 15, 20 years on EBITDA earnings or whatever, you have, you've got to have a plan to keep up there or you're just guessing. You've got to have strategic plans that, that look at risk that far out or that value is, is very susceptible uh, to, to uh, error. Next. We, uh, Keith and I <clears throat> have written an article that we could forward around with the link here that in a business, uh, Michigan Business Law Review on this whole issue of changing the rules of the game. Remember, legal remedies should not focus on the old way of thinking. And candidly, as a lawyer for 30 years has done class actions and, and, and among other things, I will tell you that class actions are just picking up the pieces at the end of the damage way after the, the damage has been done. We need to shift over to the front end to be proactive in developing remedies for long-term investors uh, and, and that will force uh, these shareholders, to ch uh, these directors to change their accounting, to build in long-term strategic thinking or, 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 or be penalized in some way if they don't. Let me go to the next slide. I don't wanna go into the details of that article other than to say that the new rules of the game that were urged by our article are really too simple, are based on two simple principles. When a director makes an investment choice, th that choice should be an informed choice. And that requires systematic information on both short-term and long-term risks. That is nothing but classic tort law, where you, lo where you look at benefits versus risk. It's classic risk assessment principles across all industries. You're not liable. You shouldn't be held liable under the law if you if you did ahead of time look at the risk in a, in a reasonable way. If you don't, it's just riverboat gambling. And we'll talk about how the duty of care under and uh, excuse me, the duty of loyalty under the Caremark line of cases 
uh, should begin to extend more, and which requires a duty to monitor, to extend more and more to mean monitor long-term risks. Now, even if you don't shift the business judgment rule to require that more, at least from a market efficiency point of view, corporations should at least be required to disclose under Delaware law whether or not they have long-term strategic thinking beyond three to five years. So you're not buying a black box when you buy stock in company X. You don't know if they're they're great or they're not uh, in terms of long-term investment. Let's go to the next slide. The elephant in the room approach of, of focusing on incentivizing and putting rules of the game for long-term uh, for for long-term strategic thinking into the boardroom is is both compatible with the strictly profit maximization model. Uh, uh, one of the consultants who you could easily use here, and I've talked to him about it just very recently, Professor Mark Zumeski, former academic dean at the University of Chicago Business School is saying that short-term thinking is absolutely inconsistent with the Chicago Market Efficiency School, as it is with Delaware Law. So the point is long-term thinking is important to maximize shareholder profits long-term. And it also, once companies do these long-term risks, they're gonna be taking into account all these environmental and other issues and, and worker-related issues that relate to societal cost as well. Next slide. The elephant in the room strategy empowers investors to change the systematic rules of corporate law to improve their portfolio returns, risk management, and company sustainability. And it's just really business 101. It's just what we're trying to do is, is implement business 101 here. Next slide. The corporations of the 21st century are different from the 18th and 19th century uh, uh, models on which the original Delaware law was based with a small company with a business judgment rule. We didn't want to second guess them, the, the business directors. We're not, these new changes would not require at all second guessing a cor corporate director. It's just saying he has to make an informed choice, which means he needs to be looking at accounting systems and having accounting systems that monitor long-term risk as well as short-term profits. Delaware has been very clear that maximizing the value of the corporation over the long term is critical. Next, uh, next, um, next point. And, she, and former Delaware Chief Justice Leo Strine, uh, in a 2019 article and many, many before then, cited in our law review article, has made the point that that in in the world that we live in, that things like environmental shortcuts, product safety shortcuts, treating workers unfairly tend to get caught out over the long term. They hurt companies over the long term. It's time to think long term for societal uh, sustainability purposes as well. Next. This can be a very tailored approach for your investment portfolio people in pension and investment firm. You don't have to look at all companies as the same. Some companies have high future value, some low, some low return on capital, some high return. You can begin to to work one on one with pick some companies, work with them, combine the carrot and stick of legal uh, 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 threats with uh, with collaboration, and get these people to start developing business models in this new normal that can change things. Once you get some exemplars, you can move forward across the across all industries with this model. Next, one need only look at the recent headlines to understand the lessons we're also learning from coronavirus. Look at Facebook, huge profits, huge privacy concerns, huge worldwide disrupts, and they, they admit over and over to Congress, well, we didn't think of that, we, we're just now learning about it. If they had built in the kind of long-term accounting systems, they could have done earlier what they're now doing today. Same problem with coronavirus. If we'd had those tests earlier, we could have stopped a lot of the dampening the curve of problems today and smoothing the curve. We need a little smoothing going forward in the world of corporate uh, decision making and not let these facts occur and then suddenly everybody tries to figure out what to think about the long term damage. Same thing with uh, opioids. Next, next uh, slide. And the problem is only getting worse. We're seeing hospitals who months ago were doing great on these short-term models and now are in a free fall and as are, are the airlines as well. We don't even have to 
I'm saying there are plenty of industries you can go focus on right now and get and get started working with them. Next. So investors, and here's the key, you have a, a, a spectrum of choices. Historically, pension funds and investors have used class actions, which is right at the tail end of after the damage has been done. We need a new way of thinking on legal remedies. You can start with collaborative engagement, combine it with shareholder resolutions. For example, the business roundtable, resolutions ought to be passed to say, okay, now that you've signed on as one of the 183 CEOs, commit but that you're gonna set up long -term, a long-term strategic plan. Books and records actions can force, under Delaware law, it can force disclosure of whether or not these people are, uh, are, are producing long-term, uh, are doing long-term strategic accounting to, to deal with the risk assessment of risk in their companies, whether it's a Facebook or an opioid manufacturer or what. And, and finally, uh, litigating to try to expand the uh, scope of fiduciary duties, not to guess what the decision was in hindsight, but to force them into, to make sure they have accounting systems in place that measure what has to be measured long-term. Next, next slide. So there's a variety of these, a continuum and a combination of these strategies that can be used. They're easy to develop. And as the next slide points out, a small number of investors are all that are needed. We have 20, 25, on the phone here, it all it takes just you. It doesn't have to take everybody. You don't have to mobilize a political campaign. All you do is to begin working with these companies one on one and focusing, pulling together, uh, uh, and hitting them with a combination of collaboration and legal remedy at attacks, and forcing, trying to force disclosure and uh, and change their way of thinking right now. Next. Uh, as you all have heard that famous Chinese phrase, and I'm not trying to mix it up with the coronavirus situation, the famous Chinese phrase of uh, every crisis is an opportunity. Uh, the, the technical Chinese dictionary always says that wasn't quite a right explanation. What that term means, it, we are, you're at a point at which things will change. We're, we today are at a point at which things will change. It's the question of whether we steer them or not. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ken. Now, Brian, are there any models of what companies are starting to do to address these issues? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Keith. Be delighted to share those with you. And just to echo some of the comments of the panelists so far, we really share the thesis that short-termism is a problem in our capital markets. Uh, in our surveys of CEOs, 80% plus of them say that they regard short-termism to be a real concern uh, in their practice. Um, our investors that we survey say only a very small minority of companies are presenting a, a long-term uh, strategic outlook. You know, we've seen the SEC uh, engage on this uh, through their uh, roundtable uh, on uh, short-termism and long-termism in our capital markets. And obviously, we do see these interaction effects uh, between short-term uh, equity market targets um, and managerial decision making, you know, the seminal case of which is cutting uh, R&D and SG&A spend to hit a short term earnings target, something that may be rational in the short term, but appears to have uh, negative impacts for value over the long term. So lots of consensus that short termism is a problem. Uh, uh, an absence of consensus perhaps about what to do about that problem. Um, and so we're kind of in the business of providing uh, mar market-based solutions. So one of the things that we've been doing is since 2017, convening CEO investor forums, uh, where we have uh, CEOs of large cap companies that come and deliver what we call a long-term plan to an audience of uh, long-term investors that's in a uh, reg FD setting. And the idea is to give them an opportunity to talk about a longer term time horizon than they do in the existing um, reporting uh, ecosystem. We're supported in that work by a, an advisory board of investors, companies, and professional service providers. And our initiative is co-shared by Alex Gorski at J&J &J and uh, Bill McNabb, formerly um, of Vanguard. 
So with that uh, preamble, what I wanted to do is talk about um, some of the motivations that CEOs uh, and others have identified for sharing uh, long-term information in this sort of very practical setting that we provided in our CEO Investor Forum. And drawing on in this slide on the outcomes of uh, the Institutional uh, Investor Trust Barometer Survey um, from Edelman, and we, we've done a, a reasonable amount of work with Edelman over the last uh, couple of years, indicating that providing forward guidance really is uh, key to cultivating um, investor trust. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, as increasing from a relatively low base, the company's providing long-term financial guidance. And we have seen some positive trends, which is that uh, the number of companies providing, you know, quarterly EPS guidance, which is often regarded as an amplifier of short-term pressures, that is, um, in, that number of companies is decreasing significantly. And obviously the um, National Investor Relations Institute in its guidance indicating that that sort of short-term guidance is now disfavored, I think is helping to push that along. And just in the context of that slide, I wanted to identify the recent SEC uh, guidance in the context of COVID, uh, saying that forward-looking information is highly prized, particularly during the crisis. And our underlying point is obviously that it is uh, not just highly prized during the crisis. What's true during the crisis is true at other times. So on the next slide, we want to talk about some of the motivations that CEOs have set out for sharing uh, long-term information. And this builds on some of the uh, content that Ariel shared um, earlier. Um, we see uh, CEOs identifying a frustration at the um, earnings call, it dominating the discourse on value, not being a great forum in which to um, share content related to the sort of long-term value drivers underlying short-term um, financial performance. Uh, we see, you know, as companies have essentially radically expanded their disclosure ecosystem, they're looking for opportunities to uh, pull all that together into a coherent uh, narrative, just to get, give a sense of the challenge. You know, we did a paper um, looking at the type of disclosures that a company needs to make to deliver a long-term plan. Um, and in order to do that, through assessing a company's existing disclosures, we had to look at 13 individual pieces of disclosures across mandatory and voluntary reporting. Um, to get a sense, even at a boilerplate level of detail at that type of reporting. So it's incumbent on companies, you know, having radically expanded their disclosure ecosystem to put it in a format that is efficient for the users of um, that information. Um, uh, drawing on uh, comments from Ariel earlier, we certainly see that sharing a long-term strategy is a, a element of uh, activist defense. We also see it as an extremely important attribute to uh, uh, choosing your investors, essentially um, uh, uh, trying to adjust your investor clientele through disclosure. Uh, we know that is effective. Um, if you uh, disclose a uh, longer term set of metrics um, across your disclosure ecosystem and you are coherent about that, um, then you will, over time, attract more long-term investors into your um, investor base, uh, and particularly where you have more ESG uh, uh, enlightened investors, uh, they tend to be more patient about things like uh, short-term earnings surprises, because ultimately should the short-term, the quarter for such investors it is just of a lower salience uh, than the uh, information that you're um, disclosing over a longer-term time horizon and your long-term um, strategy. So moving to the next uh, slide, what are some of the sort of preconditions for um, making long-term disclosures effective? A couple of those set out on the uh, left part of the screen. Um, important for companies to engage in more uh, cross-team collaboration, particularly across investor relations and corporate sustainability. Uh, we've often found that you know, the, the type of disclosures, particularly in the ESG space that companies need to make, are deeply siloed within corporations. And you've had one function that's essentially shared the sustainability report, and then one function that essentially holds the capital markets relationship. And there's a lot of pressure, I think, now to really make sure that those functions are uh, all pulling in the right direction, have kind of level set on what the key disclosures are to tell their long-term uh, story. 
So a key part of that is kind of unsiloing ESG. And we find in the companies that we talk to, the more uh, work has gone in to develop uh, the processes for handling uh, long-term disclosure themes, such as in the ESG space, uh, the better the outcome uh, when these companies try to talk about this um, in, in, to their investors. And again, a couple of fairly clear uh, disclosure principles uh, on the right side of the page to focus these um, disclosures. Uh, again, you know, when companies are talking about longer term themes, uh, it's important that they provide contextualizing disclosures so that they're um, not indulging in sort of uh, impression uh, management. You know, when they're disclosing, again, particularly on ESG themes, important to use the uh, lens of materiality to ensure they're providing decision relevant disclosures. Uh, and again, the key piece, obviously, in this uh, disclosure guidance is that the information is forward looking over a long term time horizon. And we ask for a mix of uh, financial, operational and strategic metrics to be able to tell that full story. So on the next slide. Uh, you will see our uh, long-term plan content framework. This is when we're working with companies, helping them build their long-term plan presentations to deliver it at our CEO Investor Forum. We really ask them to try to address these core uh, themes. Uh, this was developed uh, in work we did with Professor George Serafine at Harvard Business School and KKS advisors, and it draws on hundreds of pieces of investor feedback. Um, uh, from investors that have attended our CEO uh, Investor Forum. And as you can see, it's essentially a blend of uh, the type of themes uh, that you would expect a company to have to address in order to set out a meaningful uh, long-term strategy. Uh, and it also embeds within it um, some of the disclosures that may have been essentially siloed in sustainability reporting and where asking for it to be brought into an investor facing setting and modeled for uh, an investor audience. Um, so as you'll see, you have key uh, features such as uh, capital allocation, you know, what's the enduring framework for applying capital? What's the approach to M&A? Um, what are your capital distribution priorities? And, you know, obviously amid the COVID-19 crisis, the at attitude to capital allocation, uh, you know, distribution to shareholders, uh, debt levels, uh, I think all that has been thrown into very, very sharp uh, relief. Um, so just moving to the, and, and obviously actually human capital is, again has, uh, has received a, a massive amount uh, of attention um, in the last uh, several weeks as this crisis has unfolded. And on the next slide you'll see again drawing on the uh, Edelman Trust uh, Barometer Institutional Investors. If you move to the next slide, you'll see um, the uh, attributes that uh, investors have identified as being key to long-term value. And I just included that to indicate uh, how clear the crossover is between investor expectations uh, and our uh, content framework. So what I wanted to very briefly do is to quickly rattle through uh, in the next couple of slides some uh, examples of emerging practices and some illustrative concepts from um, disclosures that we've received at our uh, CEO uh, Investor Forum. So obviously megatrends is a, a absolutely critical issue for companies to, in order to demonstrate a long-term uh, time horizon. Our societies are subject uh, to huge megatrends such as you know, the, the, in, the tightening gear of climate change, uh, the transition to the low carbon economy, our aging societies, uh, particularly in the US, uh, you know, gilded age levels of inequality. Um, and it's incumbent on companies to respond to those trends and identify uh, how they land within their sector, because obviously though these trends are experienced uh, sort of society and economy wide, they will land asymmetrically within um, particular um, industries. So we think there's a really important opportunity to both demonstrate a long term a, a, a time horizon and demonstrate how you're responding uh, to these and using some of the tools available, such as if you have a, a, a large GHG footprint, then you're likely to be the sort of uh, company that is going to need to report against TCFD and conduct 
uh, scenario analysis, which is um, something that companies should feel very confident disclosing. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see uh, just a, a few examples of how companies have sought to address this by uh, both just identifying the key megatrends uh, and then uh, how they're allocating capital towards them is one of the next uh, uh, conversations that they tend to go into. And we, I really like the uh, uh, disclosures by Delphi, which is an automotive company, which indicate the way in which um, over a very long-term time horizon, the intensity of these megatrends will um, change in terms of the way they affect um, uh, the, their business. So again, just a really good way of signaling a long-term time horizon. Next slide, please. Uh, I've talked uh, 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 a number of times so far about how key ESG is to telling a company's forward story. Uh, there are a number of ways for a uh, company to do that. Um, and they can do a number of things. They can you know, talk about the process that they use to identify and prioritize um, ESG issues. Uh, and then they can also then talk about the type of uh, key metrics that they need to disclose uh, to, to enable investors to understand that performance. On the next slide, you'll see just a couple of materiality uh, assessments that companies have disclosed. We thought the, the conversation provided by the CEO of Nestle was particularly good, uh, as it both described the process for keeping that updated, you know, reviewed by management, reviewed by the board, the group within which the com within the company that holds that, and then using the materiality assessment as a basis for talking about uh, key priorities as part of its shared value uh, approach. Um, as ever, a number of ways of doing that, but we thought that was very interesting. I think where companies are increasingly going to get to is in, uh, layering a forward-looking approach onto their uh, materiality uh, assessments. There's some terrific academic work providing a taxonomy around how to do that. Uh, in the recent Sarah Feynman Rogers paper, Pathways to Materiality, linking the materiality assessment to the long-term um, outlook. And on the next slide, again, you know, we've seen human capital uh, uh, placed absolutely front and center in terms of uh, the value uh, that companies generate, uh, their reputation, their role in society. Really important for companies to set out how um, they're managing human capital, not just for now, but for how their business model is going to change um, over time. And obviously, so many investors have identified that this is a critical area for more disclosure. And obviously, there have been rulemaking uh, petitions about this uh, by um, various uh, investor groups. So on the next slide, you'll see a couple of different approaches. I won't go into them in detail due to time. Um, but again, the importance of providing real metrics, you know, moving beyond this kind of general commentary that you hear from companies that, you know, our employees are very important to us. So, yes, we appreciate that, but how and in what way and what um, metrics are you using to manage that? And what do investors need to know to understand your human capital management story? Really interesting uh, uh, picture from JetBlue about how um, they're both trying to increase the pipeline of uh, pilots uh, that they have um, in addition uh, to meeting some of their diversity goals. I know it's probably not the best time to choose an uh, airliner uh, example, but nonetheless, um, at the time of presenting, uh, <laughs> that was um, an excellent um, um, example. But again, it's just an important way of companies to um, set out uh, how they're managing this key feature uh, and how their thoughts about that uh, change over time. Each of our each of the presentations that we've had so far is available on um, our website, and we have a substantial basis of publications uh, looking at the practice of uh, delivering these long-term plans, and it's something that we'll continue to uh, do over the next uh, several years uh, as I think you know the temperature increases on on, on these uh, on these key issues and companies uh, respond to this new disclosure paradigm. Uh, so thanks for organizing this, Keith. Over to you. Um, thank you, Brian and uh, Ken and Ariel. Um, you've really identified, I think, some opportunities uh, during the COVID crisis uh, for investors to work collaboratively to improve company and uh, portfolio performance while also moving uh, our economy, financial system, and society to a more sustainable um, model. So um, 
We'd like to uh, uh, maybe go over uh, about five minutes. I know we're at the uh, top of the hour, um, but just uh, we've got a couple of questions, um, and uh, we'd like to uh, to get to them. Um, so, um, Ken, I guess the uh, this is maybe a, a question starting out for you. Um, is is what we're talking about uh, a pipe dream, given the uh, regulatory uh got a deadlock in the uh, in the US um is this realistic you know i was thinking about this question should have put a slide in Vince lombardi once said keep your eye on the ball and the ball here is guess who has the money you people on the phone guess who's going to desperately need the money in the next year or two these companies frantically coming out of the coronavirus thing. They're going to be coming to you with all sorts of plans. All you, You're in the driver's seat. All you have to do is say, I want to see some long-term planning. I want to see some strategic planning going on here. You are not the victims. You're the people in control. Just as one other remark, in 2008, Keith and I were over in Amsterdam in some international conference of pension funds and they were all crying, we're the victims, these corporations, the short-term accounting has ruined us. And I remember turning to one of those funds and saying, you know, you're not the victim, you got the money. Those Many of these corporate uh, CEOs are saying, gosh, we wish we could do more long-term planning, but we don't have the backing of the big institutional investors. So this is a golden opportunity here. Actually, the, what the models that all of us here are talking about today in run this whole regulatory deadlock, I mean, we can go on forever at passing more regulatory laws. And I'm not saying they're not bad. I'm just saying that the Delaware courts and your personal collaboration uh, and getting directors to do this strategic thinking is the key to the whole thing. And you've got the purse strings at this point. I think you can make it happen. I, far from a pipe dream, I think we've got all the pieces together. Even the business roundtable is pushing this. What you need, though, is they have to be pushed or they will fall back into the old way of thinking. If I could just hop in, I would love to, to echo that sentiment. I think you know our, our research has broadly demonstrated that everything that was discussed here on this call is within the power of um, the corporate board, their management teams, as well as uh, long-term institutional shareholders to take action and alleviate there there doesn't need to be any necess there doesn't necessarily need to be any regulatory change for us to to push this change in the capital markets so 100 percent agree on that front yeah and i just wanted to echo echo the the, the prior speakers this is a problem uh, which you know corporate management and long-term investors have substantial agency over um you know the there are ways in which the reporting ecosystem as it currently exists can be you know, reused and repurposed to meet uh, the long-term value creation objectives that we have uh, identified. You know, you've seen some of the kind of private ordering moves, right, to move away from uh, quarterly EPS guidance, which people have a concern about, replacing that steadily with guidance with a longer term time horizon. You know, all that has happened absent any regulatory move. And in fact, you know, in the discussions with the SEC last year, there was, you know, no expectation that that there would be a reduction in reporting uh, frequency. That the, the key is to use the reporting ecosystem to talk about issues that have a longer term time horizon. You know, we, we know that short termism does a poor job of addressing those precursors of financial performance uh, like ESG. Um, so it's really incumbent on companies and investors to remodel the corporate investor dialogue um, to discuss longer term themes. You know, we're, we're actually producing a paper later this month, publishing a paper later this month, literally called ESG and the Earnings Call premised on the basis that even in that short-term accountability environment, it ought to be possible to talk about longer-term themes. So yes, yeah, so I, I completely agree with prior speakers. And, and Keith, if I could say one other thing, there, just like in the auto industry in the 70s and 80s, there was this myth that they nothing could be done or consumer quality, you couldn't improve it. 
The myth today is that there's too much uncertainty to do long-term planning. It's precisely the opposite. When you do best case, worst case, and middle case scenarios, literally the thinking that has to go on within the, in the corporations to even think about that forces them to become aware of the key issues that could hurt them down the road. So it, it's precisely in times of uncertainty that you need to increase your long-term thinking, best case, worst case, middle case. It, it works. It works very effectively. And, uh, and, and uh, that, that myth, uh, uh, it, it needs to be uh, put aside immediately. Hi, uh, good morning. This is Jonna McCarthy calling from the New York State Common Retirement Fund. Um, I have a question that concerns, there, there's still a stampede, at least through the end of the last year, um, from active management um, to indexed management, and many institutions are indexed. Um, the kind of structural shift you're talking about from, you know, investors demanding long-term plans, how are they necessarily incentivized if they're, they're indexed? And um, potentially, given this shift, which I don't know if it's continuing, but, but certainly have been continuing through the end of last year, this shift from, um, uh, from active to passive, doesn't that just give more influence to active managers, most of whom... Um, who are, are, are not long-term, how, how, do we, how do we overcome this? Keith Johnson, you, you've got some on that, don't you? It sounds like Keith might be having some technical trouble, so uh, maybe I'll just jump in. Um, you know, one thing that we've seen in terms of flows, and you're right, there have been significant flows towards uh, uh, passive products over the last several years, and, and perhaps... Uh, the current market volatility disrupts some of that, but I think it, it's expected to continue to be a longer term theme in investing. Um, we have seen those passive managers wake up to the fact that engagement is very important part of their job. Um, when you are an index strategy and you don't have the option to sell or to evaluate a company um, based on the merits of their own uh, outlook, then it's incumbent on you to engage with that organization to ensure that they are indeed managing the company for long-term growth, because that's the only way that an index product is going to deliver return over time. Um, and, and we've seen the engagement teams at large passive managers like State Street and BlackRock and Vanguard, um, you know, they've been adding headcount over the last several years. Their, their engagement activity has been increasing and they've started to report on those engagements. So, so those are all trends that I think are moving in the positive direction and can help offset some of those shorter term more active players that um, I suspect you're alluding to on that, on that other side of the coin. Um, that's not to say that active managers, though, are always short term. We've seen a lot of very active fund managers take a longer term perspective. You know, if you look at the Wellingtons or the Bailey Giffords of the world, those are those are organizations that manage large pools of assets in an active way and uh, often have significant engagements with the companies in their portfolios as well. So I think it is a small percentage of the investment community that has that shorter term active perspective, but they've been the loudest over time. So it is incumbent on the long term members of the investment community to speak up to counteract that uh, loud segment of the population that tends to get more media coverage perhaps than they deserve. Yeah, this is Keith, too. I apologize. I was um, going on eloquently and um, was muted. So um, what the point I was going to make is that um, this is really kind of a step change where given trends in Delaware corporate law, we now appear to have the potential opportunity to basically change corporate law to require boards to engage in at least examine and tell investors what they're doing on long-term strategic thinking. That, as a corporate law requirement, would transform corporate legal counsel, um, company advisors, directors and officers, liability insurance companies into uh, advocates for 
long-term strategic thinking. So it has the potential to, I hate to use this term, but raise all boats. Keith, uh, this is an, that's an excellent point. Uh, and uh, we need a test case or people who will afford to bring a test case. And I would suggest along with a strategy of trying to to uh, work at the same time in carrot and stick fashion with that case to try to get companies to change their behavior. And point two is even though we, we are facing the headwinds of these indexing funds that you know are all kind of circular short-termism, uh, we remember that it, this is amount of, it's not all or nothing. Uh, pension funds should be allocating a substantial amount to longer term investments as well. And in that area, it's a matter of starting from that sector of investment and, and expanding. Uh, so as companies come in and want more money and want more help, you, 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 you grab that opportunity and, and, and insist that they in turn uh, go longer term. I mean, this, this has a mushrooming ability, but we got to start somewhere. Best cases, along with a, putting pressure on companies that could be well be great values for you coming down the road after the coronavirus thing, uh, it, it, it gives you an opportunity to make really important money and, and, and protect your pension fund long term at, at the same time, despite the indexing fund problem. Yeah, and a, and a quick a quick addition to the the comments on uh, the message that you hear from your investors. I think it's really incumbent on companies through their investor relations program to ensure that they're receiving a balanced view um, as to investor priorities um, across the different investor segments. You know, the the noisier parts of the investment ecosystem get a cut at management every 90 days on the earnings call. Um, and you know, I think that has often led to that kind of discourse that you've often heard from, you know, particularly sort of CFOs and IROs that, you know, that the message they hear from investors is that they're not particularly interested in things like, you know, the long-term ESG themes and so on. Uh, I think that's actually starting to change even in the context of the earnings call. But actually, then there are those other investor segments, such as the indexes, such as the long only actives, you know, who actually um, you know, have to ensure that their uh, voice is, is being heard. Um, and I think if you look at the you know, engagement priorities that many of the large indexes have you know, begun to put on um, companies' agendas, those are obviously extremely well aligned with the long term themes that we've set out. You know, in addition to having, uh, you know, as essentially perpetual holders of capital, uh, an intrinsically long-term uh, time horizon. And why not an index for uh, long-term uh, funds? Why not the? Why doesn't? Why don't the investors uh, create that market rather than just buying whatever is brought to them from Wall Street? Why can't even on the indexing basis, you could have an index of a number of funds, all com of all of companies all committed to a long-term strategy. If all the research you've seen today is right, that's going to be more profitable anyway than the short-term index. Well, it sounds to me like this is a topic that might be a good one for a, uh, a follow-on um, webinar or uh, discussion at some point. So um, given that we're 15 minutes over, I think we're going to have to cut it off now. Thank you very much for those of you who uh, stayed for the uh, extra uh, Q&A time, and uh, appreciate you joining. Uh, hope that uh, you all are able to stay safe and well. Thank you for attending. Goodbye.